Oh, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. He's a chronicler of New York, a member of the tribe, a mensch. He's a prize-winning, best-selling novelist, a high school dropout, editor of both New York City tabloids, The Daily News and The Post. He's a forger of the New York alloy, a newspaper man. He's Pete Hamill. His new book, Tabloid City, is the story of another newspaper man and his New York. Pete is the author of 20 previous books, including the best-selling Forever and Snow in August and the acclaimed memoir, A Drinking Life. A legendary journalist, he holds the Ernie Pyle Lifetime Achievement Award from the National Association of Newspaper Columnists. He is distinguished writer in residence at New York University. Lucky them. Pete, this is an honor, and even though we've never met, I know you both through your work and through our mutual friend Dennis Duggan, to whom these, these chats are dedicated, another newspaper man. Let's go to Tabloid City. Uh, great reviews, Times loved it, Tribune loved it. Talk about the story and its generation. What is this about? About, um, on one level, it's about the craft that I spent half a century practicing, working for newspapers, primarily tabloids. Um, it's also about the people that make up the subject matter of tabloids. And the reason that's important is that one of the things about tabloids as compared to some of the great broadsheets mm -hmm. and times and, um, is they have to be faithful to the local to the people one at a time who live in the city because they have a double function many times. They explain newcomers to the older people who are here and they explain the city to the newcomers. My father didn't become an American uh, until he, he got baseball. Mm. He didn't get baseball in the Federalist Papers right. or by reading de Tocqueville. <laughs> He got it from the Daily News yep. sports section. The Mirror, the, the Journal of American. And yep. the Brooklyn Eagle. Yep. He, because he was in Brooklyn, he had to be a Brooklyn fan for the rest of his life. Right. Wherever he is, he's a Brooklyn fan. So are you. <laughs> so I'll, am I. I'll say Walter O'Malley. What's yeah. your first reaction? Yeah, Hitler, Stalin, and Walter, Walter O'Malley. I'm sorry, go ahead. Three worst people of the 20th century. <laughs> go ahead. Um, so I think that... The, the crisis that newspapers are in, uh, in part, triggered the book. But I wanted it not to be just a lament for the passing of newspapers. Uh, this is an imaginary newspaper, an afternoon paper. We haven't had one in years. Well, I guess the uh, last one was The Post, no? Yeah, it was The Post. And Murdoch basically made it a m morning paper. Right, and then he did the Sunday edition. Too. Yeah, right. Um, uh, but the, the sense that a, that a newspaper gave people, uh, particularly, uh, I think, the Daily News, when it was the champion, it was the basic mm. band. It was, you know, the thing that bound every borough to every other borough. Standing and, with my father on the street you know, corner waiting for the night owl. Yeah, the news and mirror. Throwing it two, out. Two cents a piece yep. and a little bunch yep. of Yep, and chicken. all those working class guys yeah. were there waiting for the exactly. paper with their kids. Yeah. And the afternoon papers, uh, you know, basically fleshed out the stuff that was broken in the morning papers. Uh, and gave us West Coast basketball scores and all that, you know. So to see that beginning to fade... Uh, makes my heart tremble a little bit. I'm optimistic about about journalism itself because I've seen these kids at NYU and in the other journalism schools. They have the passion. They want to do it. I teach them at CUNY. Uh, yeah, and they want to do it. They want to lead useful lives. They don't want to just be rich or famous. Uh, they they would never use that awful movie, this, The Social Network, as a training film. 
nice. uh, to imitate some of the the lousiest young people I've seen in many years. <laughs> Ooh, uh, there's news, it's, lousiest it's, young people. Yeah, God, it's I bet a you beautiful, that. beautifully executed movie, but God, why would anybody want to be any of them? Oh, uh, go so, to it. So uh, that, that was gnawing at me at the beginning. And uh, when I began to think seriously about doing a novel that would summarize it rather than a memoir, mm. um, uh, I, the, the, the various people started coming to life. Yeah. To life. Uh, so it's about Sam Briscoe and and Helen Loomis, the woman who's proud of the title "Best Rewrite Man in New York City." And but the, the characters <laughs> are so well delineated. You knew these people, of obviously. Yeah, of course. Are you Sam Briscoe? I, you know, I always quote Flaubert. Go ahead. Madame Bovary, say moi. Every character is me. Okay. You okay. know, there's a painter in here. Right. Lou Forrest yep. from Brownsville. Great character. Going blind. Yep. Uh, he's the painter I might have been if I had stayed with the first ambition to be an artist. Right. When I went to Mexico on the GI Bill. I, I, I could have been him in the, in the Chelsea Hotel now, uh, watching the end of days and unable to see even his own work. Um, a lot of the others... Um, could have been me. Mm. The, the young jihadist could have been Oof. me. Could have been me if I was an IRA fanatic. Mm -hmm. If there were things that I thought were more important than life itself, uh, which I didn't feel. Uh, I hated abstractions uh, as a result of being a reporter. That all abstractions lead you into certain kind of traps. Yeah, what you call the the, the trap of the big idea. Yeah, yeah. ideology to me whether it's religious or, or political, is always, it's, always a, it's not thinking, it's a substitute for thought. And one result of that is you can end up with a lot of corpses in the yard. So I've always been very critical and, and uh, um, skeptical about ideology. But I did know people uh, who had a streak of fanaticism Mm -hmm. them and grew out of it. Okay. I knew guys who, who joined the Muslims at the height of Malcolm X and others, and then they got married and their wives had more common sense, like how do we feed our children instead of embarking on uh, crusades for separatism and all that. So there's a, there's a lot of that all. Okay, play and, 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 and also characters. it's classic yeah. it's classic tabloid. I mean, you can imagine reading the paper over this period, and yeah. and then that's what it is. And one of the things that struck me, and which I did, was you. In one of your writings, you say, "Just look at the the disparate characters that are found in one edition of one day." One day. Yeah. And I did it for a week just of the Daily News, and it was it's incredible the number of characters. Yeah. And the newspapers, as you s suggest here and elsewhere, are sort of the the, the weavers of the narrative. Yes. So what yeah. happens when the weavers aren't there anymore? Are, are, are there replacement weavers out well, there? Well, there are people working on it. There, there are people in the journalism schools and in the papers wondering exactly about losing the local. Uh, they have forms called hyper-local. Right. I don't know what's hyper about it. They, you know, writing is writing, reporting is reporting. A lot of visual uh, multimedia stuff, a, too. But it's a way to have the big paper that will tell you what's happening in Afghanistan or Iraq or distant places and help you understand what's happening in the neighborhood next door to yours, that you can go and see what's happening. Just the last week, there's been a lot of gunfire in the city. Suddenly, yeah. kids, kids gunning down kids. Yeah. Uh, a must, blip or something else? It must make else. the NRA happy because they obviously are in business to keep the Mexican narcos, the Crips, and the Bloods happy uh, by having an endless supply of guns to kill people here and in Ciudad Juarez. Um, Which you wrote very powerfully uh, about in your essay and your talk at NYU that's now on yes. a Kindle, which right. I read on my phone. I mean, lots, it, it's, it's coming from here. Yeah. The guns are from here, and the and the the demand is from here. When I see Charlie Sheen bragging about the, how many rocks of cocaine he he used one weekend, 
I want to say, pal, you're killing little kids going for a bottle of milk in, in some little town on the border, baby. Wow. You know, Oof. I, I can't stand Heavy it. Heavy burden. You know. Heavy burden. So in the book, you, you've got two murders, and in a sense, you have the death of a newspaper. So you've got three, three bodies. What struck me was, on page 105, Briscoe's reaction to the murder of Cynthia Harding who is his lover and longtime friend, he, he acts like a, an editor. He, he sort yeah. of, just his first reaction it's, is tough. I said to myself, man, I have to ask Camel. I mean, would, would an and editor... And he knows it. And he knows it. And he says, stop it. Stop it. The but it's so he, The woman bread. he's been with for 20 years, um, they don't live together, but they live together apart, mm -hmm. um, has been murdered. And his other great obligation in life is to get the paper out. Yeah. And part of that, when you ask me, is Sam Briscoe me? The, nothing like this has ever happened to me. But I had a great editor at the Post named Paul Sam. Like many of the older generation, he had started as a copy boy when he was 18 and ended up executive editor of the Post. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a wife he loved passionately. Um, and she died on a Friday. Uh, he came in at midnight because he had a Saturday column called It Happened All Over. He came in, sat down at his desk at the far end of the city room, oh, and wrote the piece about this woman that he had loved. And, and then he got up, checked the wood, as we used to call it, the page one headline, and left. And in many ways, this, this scene and this reaction mm. of Sam Briscoe to the death of, of somebody he loves, suddenly uh, he has to do what he has done for thousands of strangers over a long lifetime and at least bury her with some kind of gravity and some kind of respect. And then he finally goes home, you know. So it, it was based on things that do happen, and he lashes himself for it. How can you do this? How can you worry about the newspaper? And the, of course, he, he can't do anything else. He's a newspaper man. But you were a newspaper man, and now you are a novelist. Talk about the difference in the writing in terms of being a newspaper man. And what is a novelist? What's the advantage of being a novelist? First of all, you can get into the interior lives of the characters. Mm. You can't do you, that. You can't write a, 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 a column which is always subjective, um, but it's subjectivity in the way Breslin and I, Murray Kempton, mm. and other people wrote columns. It was subjective, it was opinion based on reporting. Yep. Not reading the yep. Washington Dennis Post. Dennis Duggan. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, right. Dennis Duggan. Right. Example. Right. A uh, very good example. And you were there. And you were there. And you, you, you wrote it. You weren't there every day sometimes. Right. But in a novel, um, a novel being a work of the imagination, not just of reporting, um, you can go places the reporter can't go, and basically that is into the heart of the people um, that you would otherwise be covering. Right. You know, the, you can find out, you can imagine your way into the, the life led by a character when that character is alone. Mm -hmm. Because that's the other binding thing in the novel, which is how do people deal with solitude? Right. Um, uh, some people, the, the loneliness gnaws at them until it destroys them. Others, solitude can be an amazingly rich thing. It's no accident that some of the people who do live alone have great private libraries, including the woman cartoonist, the, yep. the woman who was murdered, Cynthia Harding, is a great benefactress of the, of the library with Brooke Astor as a kind of model. Mm -hmm. um, and Briscoe himself has a huge library. Uh, and, and one of them says straight out, as long as I have some books, I'm never alone. 
And I think, if I may, you seem to be the, the type, the archetype of that. I mean, you, you dropped out of Regis High School. I mean, you know, even though the, Jesu the Jesuits never left you. We'll talk about that uh, later on. You read Pete Hamill, and there, you, you, you are a learned man. And where did, it, where did you read all of this? And what do you read now? Well, the reading habit I had from very young, I mean, I, I was always reading. I, I don't remember read, learning how to read, which means my mother probably taught me. I was the you oldest You carried a book around with you in your pocket? Yeah, no, I would read, and I, I guess, on the stoop. Or something. Come the stoop. You know, I remember reading one summer the Count of Monte Cristo from mm. the library on the cellar board around the corner, wooden cellar board around the corner from our house. We had no backyard where we lived in Brooklyn. So on the cellar board, reading it, and, and, and so it was the longest book I had ever read at the time. Um, Any particular book strike you then that, not that you would want to write that book, but be able to write? Did any book stimulate? I didn't. The, I didn't think of. I, I, I didn't think of the of, of such a person as a writer. Okay. This was a story. Okay. You know. Okay. I, did I want to go to Treasure Island with Jim Hawkins? Of course. Who wouldn't want to? But I also had a taste for sort of uh, cheap popular literature. I loved the Bomba the Jungle Boy series. The first book I ever finished was Bomba the Jungle Boy at the Giant Cataract. I, I had to look up cataract in the dictionary to find out it was not something one of my aunts had in her eye. I found out it was a waterfall. But it was the first narrative that I read mm -hmm. all the way to the end uh, that was all basically text. Uh, so I was from a generation that read for entertainment. Yeah, that, well, not, yeah. Be, not to write a paper right. or an analysis, right. but to be carried away beyond the world of the tenements. And I think there were millions like me in, in New York Are City. we losing that? I think we are, yeah, because it's and too it, easy to... Just I, I, grew up, I grew up before television, so I, I, I couldn't change my mood by going like this, to go from a ball game to a horror movie without doing any work. Uh, and, right. And, but I didn't, at the same time, need a soundtrack to tell me what to feel or a laugh track to tell me when to laugh. Well, you know, you, you laughed or you listened. So I was very fortunate... Uh, growing up when I did, to, to have the richness of that before television conquered in the, in the early 50s. Um, and See, I'm at the tail end of that because we didn't have a, a TV early on and we read as well. Yeah. And then my kids, obviously, and then my grandkids, it's so totally different. I, it was just, it's such a different world and I'm, you know, part of it's old fogeyism, but part of it is really Sitting down with Captain Blood or, or yeah. Jim Hawkins, come on, you, yeah. could, you could spend, you, yeah. you were transported to another world. Yeah. I know. But I thought D'Artagnan was from Brooklyn. Oh, he was. <laughs> he was a street smart New Yorker. Yeah, we'll talk was, about that he was too. Ninth Street and Sixth Avenue, where the library was. This book is very, very cinematic and in and, and the best sense of the word because there's a lot of detail. And a lot of the people that you, that I've noticed that you read are also cinematic and almost cinematic before their time. Zola and Twain and Balzac. They were doing movies before they, they, yeah. they were movies and you, this is, this is a movie. Have, is there a contract? Is there interest? <laughs> There's a, this, this is a movie. If there is, I don't. They I, better tell they you. They didn't tell me yet. This is a movie. Because we'll it's see. rich in its detail. But but I that's think, your journalism. I think what you're pointing out, though, uh, that a lot of the great, particularly 19th century writers, wrote, were writing cinematically before the invention of cinema. Uh, when I was trying to teach myself how to write, uh, in the late 50s, early 60s, I would take a paragraph by Joseph Conrad, uh, A Storm at Sea. Mm -hmm. I'd change it into a storm on land. If it was rain, I would change it to snow. So every noun changed. Wow. Every verb changed. Every adjective changed. But the structure wow. remained the same. And mostly, it was almost always cinematic. Wide shot, two shot, nice. close up. Good. <laughs> you know? And he didn't yet know about mm. 
later on he lived to be old enough to have seen movies. Uh, but at the time, he was seeing the world cinematically. Right, so. and, and part of it is that it's sort of subject, verb, object, yeah. real crisp, clean. That's the way you write. I mean, that's the way this book is written. That's the way your journalism is written. It's, it's yeah, very direct. Concrete no nouns, active verbs. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> Literally. And, and, don't cut off, yeah. and cut off the beginnings and the end. Yeah. So if you, you get if, to the detail. Yeah. I mean, there was. I learned a lot, even when I was writing journalism, uh, from reading great fiction. Yeah. Particularly short stories, because short stories, uh, you know, have to deal with the, how much space you have. And writing for a newspaper is about space as Oof. much as time. Oh yeah. You know. Kelvino quote. I I, I, I mean, the, the the books are replete with great quotes. No book about a book is better than the book itself. Your, your comment sort of on academic criticism and art criticism in particular, but academic literature criticism, that it's, it's purposefully obscure. It's not meant to communicate. Why, I mean, you might, might ask me why. I don't know why. I, I don't know either. I think they're writing for each other. The, 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 those critics are writing for each other. I don't think they particularly enjoy literature. So they write, often write like prosecutors instead of defense attorneys. Whereas the guys, that, the critics that have been most valuable to me were also critics who had tried or wrote fiction. John Updike is mm -hmm. a great literary mm -hmm. critic. V.S. Pritchett is a great literary critic. Um, Edmund Wilson had tried novels, so he knew that it wasn't easy to do this. Right. Um, the, they are the, the, the guys who actually had done it were the most useful to a, a young guy like me who didn't really know anything but was trying to find out uh, because they were about clarity. They, want, they weren't saying, you know, sorry, pal, try to read me. Right. You know, they didn't, right. that right. was not the slogan. Right. They, said, right. they were saying, please read me. Okay. All of your, almost all of your books, Tokyo Sketches accepted almost, is the, the main character is New York, probably more than any other living novelist, you are a New York writer, if you that, will. That's right, that's right. Even when I, in the 60s, when I traveled a lot, I lived in Rome, I lived in Dublin, I lived in other places, Puerto Rico. And, and you live places. in Mexico. And you live and, in and Mexico. And I go back and forth right, to, to Mexico, Mexico all the time. But um, I lived there as a New Yorker because it was, uh, it was what formed me. It was, then, and I always say, I'm, I was attracted to Latin countries, for example. But I always say between the consonants of New York and the vowels of Latin America, I might get a decent sentence out of myself every once in a while. This is good. I mean, the and rhythms. And you've been successful. The, ryth the rhythms are different. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you learn. Yep, yep, yep. Um, you learn about people through their language. And But you have a love for the city. And, and one of the terms that you use, and we may have to explore it more fully next week, is you talk about the New York alloy. Talk about that metaphor and its meaning, because we've heard of the, you know, the beautiful mosaic. We've heard of the melting pot, but this this is a different this is a different term here. What do you yeah. mean by the New York alloy? Well, it, it mainly is is not the melting pot, because when I hear melting pot, I think of fondue. Right. You know, <laughs> I don't think <laughs> and this is onions, not the right. city that right. of, of ethnic fondue. Right. Um, but what, what I think that happened in New York, and it was not in any plan or anything, was that the people who came already had some iron in them. You didn't leave your country and cross an ocean and come to a strange place with a different language uh, if you didn't have some iron in you. And I think under the pressure of the city, under the pressure of, of above all, work, mm because the object was work, and the pressure of collision and of resentment on the part of some of the older people. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the old WASP establishment was very uncomfortable with all these Italians, Jews, and Irishmen mm -hmm. hanging around in, in the place they thought they owned. Uh, but under the pressure, I think it has created an alloy which is stronger 
the combinations of other metals stronger than each individual metal. Uh, if the Italians had stayed in some kind of isolation and never merged with the rest of the city, they wouldn't be as strong as they are. Mm. They wouldn't be, have contributed as much as they have to this country. You know, not just with work, but with food, with music, with all kinds of sure. uh, art that has come out of being able to feel a part of the same thing. Is, is, is the New York Forge a unique forge? Other cities create other alloys? I think Chicago does to some point, mm. uh, to some extent. Interesting. Uh, and they, for, for, I, I think Chicago also handled the migration of African Americans from the South to the northern cities better than we did. You know, they, they somehow merged it. For, I mean, there's music, the, particularly with music. The blues found a home in Chicago. Mm -hmm. It took a while in New York. Mm -hmm. You know, songs like, going to Chicago, sorry, but I can't take you. You know, those kind of songs are about the ache of having to leave even the South with all the, the heritage. It's still the place where you were five years old and barefoot and running in a field. You know, that there was an ache that that, that, that migration brought to us and a, an amazing richness that added to the European thing ended up making something unique. Okay, we, we, we need to stop here and then come back for the next episode of this conversation, but let's come back and talk about this alloy a little bit more as well as other things. Sure. My thanks to Pete Hamill for being on the show. Pete has agreed to come back next week for more about his new book, Tabloid City, and much more. See you here on CUNY TV. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. Whatever it is, thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it. Send it. <laughs>